You're listening to the Patriot Nation Podcast. Welcome into another edition of the Patriot Nation podcast. It's your boy Pat Lane here, as always, with my guy Matt St. Jean. And as with every episode, this episode is brought to you by Prize Picks, which is the official daily fantasy sports app of CLNS. You got to go to download the app today and put in the promo code CLNS, and they will match your first deposit up to $100, 100%. And it's the best deal in town with the Final Four going on right now. Everyone's bracket's busted already, probably, and so get out there and and do some uh, do some of these, and it, it just makes it so much more fun, I think, uh, when you get some of those daily fantasy things going instead. So, uh, Matt, here we are during the owners' meetings. We have we have a Gerard Mayo sipping orange juice meme uh, already. I love it. I absolutely love it. That had to have been intentional. Had to have been intentional on Mayo's I love part. It. Um, and, uh, and I'm excited. I'm genuinely excited about where we're going. Yeah, no, it's, I think what's interesting too is, um, I think there was a, a change in tone in some of the quotes we got mm -hmm. with this, the NFL owners meeting, which we will get into it. But, um, I think it's fair to say that the new Patriots administration is learning why the old Patriots administration was not very open with the press about stuff yeah. Um, yeah and you know i think I, I think they've said a lot of things generally i like but i also think they've said a lot of things that will very quickly get taken out of context um, yeah and that's yeah. and and belichick knew that just as well as anyone right the fact that you know it's a situation that as soon as you say something to um to the media the media is going to respond and the media is going to make something out of nothing. Even if even if there's nothing really going on, the media is going to make something out of it. And one of the reasons why he never talked to the media, I think, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's, it's ways for things to get misconstrued. And I think, you know, one of the, one of the difficulties for the Patriots right now um, is that they exist within the Boston sports ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And the biggest kind of overarching storyline in Boston sports media right now is what's going on with the Boston Red Sox and how the owners, you know, came out with all this bluster, said they were going to make moves, did all these changes, and then made no Didn't actually do it. after a long history of not wanting to keep their own players, not spending on guys. Right. Um, and football is a very different sport. Football is hard capped in a way that baseball isn't when it comes to your spending. The way free agency looks in both of these sports, you know, the age at which players reach free agency and the quality of the free agents is very different. But because the Patriots came out and said, you know, we're going to be spending a ton and then didn't spend a ton, they're going to be viewed through this lens now. And mm -hmm. I think you have to I think you have to look at this in, in kind of two different ways. One. When it comes to actual strategy and on-field product and everything, I think they've made the right moves this offseason. You know, there was only one – like, Gerard Mayo was correct today when he said there was basically only one good free agent. We went after him. We didn't land him. They weren't going to wildly overpay like Tennessee did for Calvin Ridley. And once that happens, you know, you kind of close up shop to a degree. Um, but the flip side of this is part of being a head coach is the public relations. It That's is correct. being the media-facing person. And yeah. when you go out and – you know, try to impress a whole bunch of new people and make it can make that good impression on the fans by saying, Hey, you know, we're gonna do this because you guys have really wanted us to do this, and then you don't do it, you're setting yourself up for disappointment with those people. Um, so you know, a learning experience for those guys. And I'm sure if this administration doesn't end up going on going well, people are gonna point to these moments where they say we're gonna go spend and then they don't spend as where it all started, whether or not that's justified. Right, and old man Mob said, you know, he, he did sound disappointed when they when he said they didn't get Calvin Ridley, but I mean, they could have gotten Calvin Ridley. It just took money, and I know they didn't want to spend it, and that's fine. But like, you know, you wonder, and and I talked about this before, right? And I've been accused many times of of uh, especially especially since I 
didn't absolutely hate and despise the dynasty. Uh, I've been accused of of being a craft ball washer, as as people have said. And I said it on the show before. He doesn't have anyone to hide behind now, right? He always said, oh, the checkbook's open. Checkbook's open for Bill Belichick. It's open. And, you know, okay, put your money where your mouth is. Let's see you give Matthew Judon some money. You've been in contact with Christian Barmore. That's good. Give him a yeah. contract. Kyle Duggar is still out there. Like, obviously, he's on the transition tag, but, like, pay him. You know what I mean? Like, y- you got to do these things. If you if people are going to believe that you're going to really pay the money, you're going to have to do some of these things. And, listen, that might mean trading 34 to San Francisco for Brandon Ayuk and giving him a massive contract. And I'm okay with that. I am okay with that. I, I just and so that's San Francisco would be is kind of the issue you've run into there. And yeah, I, I think I think – not giving $23 million a year to a 29 year old wide receiver with a questionable right. track record here. I think you know, I, I agree with the front office's decision. Um, As do I it just, yeah. um, and I, here's the, the, the other part here is that because I think the fans view this as a refresh and not a reset. Mm-hmm. Um, like when you, you bring in a whole new coaching regime in GM. Usually, a fan expectation is all right. These guys get you know four, three, four years to put something together, and I right. don't think that's the fan expectation here, which I don't think is fair to the guys who were there. But um, I, I don't blame Mayo for asking for patience today because they're in, you know they're at the ground floor of this thing. They need multiple quality drafts of good players on both sides of the ball if they would like to become a contender. We are two, three, four years away from that point. Yeah. Um, uh, I just, you know, we, we gotta, it, it's, there's going to be ugly moments in that too. Like, you know, even, even the, even good teams have ugly moments. This team's not a good team. There's going to be some right. real ugly moments, even if yeah. this team is better next year than it was this past year. And, uh, I think setting expectations way too high for no reason, because you're just trying to impress a press outlet in Boston, that will always be negative on you, no matter what you do that is, is not setting yourself up for success in the public. Eye. Yes, that is correct. If you spend too much money, they'll, they'll rip you for it. If you don't spend enough money, they'll rip you for it. If you yep. sign the right guys, they'll rip you for it. If you sign the wrong guys, they'll rip you for it. If you draft the right guys, they'll rip you for it. If you draft the if, wrong guys, they'll rip you. it doesn't matter if, what you if do. You go, if you go 14 and two, they'll question, oh, but you know, the two losses are, you right. know, you didn't win the right way. You know, is it going to yeah. translate in the playoffs? Like that's, and standards here are high because you know we've raised that bar because this team has been so successful. Like I get it, but um, right, yeah, the bar. Ha- if the bar doesn't come down to some degree, then it's going to be hard to find any coach successful. <laughs> I'll yeah. that much. Well, and that's and that's really what it comes down to is that you just got to be real, uh, just be a little bit more realistic about the Patriots' chances this year. They're not. They're not competing this year. They're not. They're going to be a bad team again. They're going to. Be drafting in the top 10 again for sure. Now, will it be the top five again? I don't know, but it will be the top 10 again unless something crazy happens. So, you know, it, we need to temper expectations. At the same time, I do understand people want – people are like, well, we have all of this money. We have an insane amount of money, which we do. The Patriots have a, a ridiculous amount of money, and so you look at it and say, okay – well, we need to go out and get guys. And the problem is that those guys aren't available, right? They were going to pay for Michael Pittman. They were going to pay for T. Higgins. They were going to pay for, you know, those guys. Mike are, Evans. Apparently Mike they were going to gear it up all for him. So that's the thing is, is, you know, that's one of those things, right? And, and it, you know, it, it's tough. It, it, it is what it is. And here's the thing, right? And so here's Roberto. I'll just throw Roberto on the screen right here because he says, you know, get ready to be mediocre. Throw for him in the years. Way. And, and here's, here's what I'll say. Okay. Here's what I'll say. Is that I under I get it I do I I understand people's expectations. Here, here's what I'll ask you, okay? Would you, if would you be the Dallas Cowboys? Would you accept being the Dallas Cowboys, who were dominant in the nineties? And then just have kind of floated here and there and are good, but not great yeah. compete every year, but choke in the playoffs. Like, would you be okay with that? Or would you be upset with that? Well, and I, I think, I think the answer to that for me 
is you're going to be excited at first until it sets in. Because that's, that's the way these things go. You know, your expectations change with time. Uh, right. My expectation right now, get this team to 500 within like four years. Like just yeah. get to that point um consistently i don't i don't mean like oh like one scoop or 500 i mean all right let's be you know above 500 consecutive seasons here yeah yeah and get to that point uh and then once you get there it's about taking that next step yep uh, by, by the way players <laughs> by the way dj has the correct answer dj has the correct answer you're okay with it you're 100 percent okay with it because if you're in the playoffs every year and you're competing every year you're there now that doesn't mean you're going to win it may, you'll never win ever again. Who knows? But you're competing every year and you're knocking on the door. Now, if you can't find the right guys and Dallas has been slow to move, I would say, off of their quarterbacks, right? Mm -hmm. They haven't. They didn't move off of Romo fast enough, in my opinion. Dak, you know, if you want to move on from Dak, you need to do that. And well, so, they have an opportunity you know, after this year. They, they do. And, and so they may have to rebuild a little bit through him. But, you know, but either way. That that's kind of what I'm looking at is like it's not it's foolish to think you're going to end up being the Chiefs again in five years. That's just that's stupid. Yeah. But if you can get to a place where you're competitive and you can be competitive and, you know, a few people said it here, like you got to get non elite said it. You got to get through the draft. You have to do it through the draft because guys aren't available in free agency. Now, they're available via trade. If you want to make a trade, they're available via trade. Right. Let's let's just say that you have a good draft this year, you stick at three and draft Drake, Drake May, and Drake May is the guy. Great. You draft, you know, someone at 34, Malachi Corley, who had an awesome day at his pro day today, um, or, you know, whomever else at 34, right? And so, and you're like, okay, fine, here we go. Great, great, whatever. Next year, you're in the top 10 again. You draft like an elite defensive player or something who who really helps you out. The year after that, you're you're drafting around like 19 or something. Then you trade 19 for first for for that true legit number one wide receiver. It's what the Dolphins did. Mm -hmm. They drafted Tua. The next year they drafted Jalen Waddle. The next year they traded their first round pick for for Tyreek Hill. Right. It's what the Eagles did, where they drafted Jalen Hurts. Then they drafted Devonta Smith. Then they traded their first round pick mm -hmm. for AJ Brown. So it's like so all of these things. This is where that's the path. Like the path is. You're gonna to have to give up a first round pick to get one of those guys, but again, you're not you're not trading three for one of those guys, right? But if you're if you're that mid first round pick, you can now you've started that rebuild and that can put you over the hump. Now it hasn't worked in either of those places, although the Eagles did make the Super Bowl. They lost, of course, but the, the Eagles did make the Super Bowl. But you know, it's it gets you to a position where you go from a good team to a very good team from that one move and that move makes sense. I think it's also, you know, that's one way to do it. The other way, you look at the 49ers who've been in the Super Bowl, yep. just in it. They got two of the better receivers in the NFL. IU is the true number one. And Debo is, you know, of I think, a, depending on how you view him, a, a mid-tier wide receiver one, all the way down to a really, really high-end wide receiver two, depending on how you view his skill set. Yeah, they got both of those guys in the draft. Neither one of them took a first round pick to get. I don't think Ayuk. I think was Ayuk was a late late first round. Was pick. he late first? Okay, yeah. but they're still they're both in that late first early second window, you know. And that's yeah. where yeah, that's where Justin Jefferson came from. Mm -hmm. He also came from that window. Mm -hmm. So you know, a lot of ways to do this, and I think they can roll over cap space. Um, so you can roll over cap space in the next year, and you know, let's say. You can't get a trade for Ayuk or Debo Samuel if he if he ends up on the market instead. Yep. You just you just you can't make it happen this year. And Justin Jefferson doesn't hit the market or whatever. Well, let's say a wide receiver hits the market next year, and let's say more importantly, let's say a wide receiver hits the market who has a big contract and a team can't afford mm -hmm. it. Well, mm -hmm. now you can afford that, and you know you can do what the the Browns did when they got Amari Cooper. They sent a fifth round pick for him because Dallas couldn't afford him anymore. Right. Um, you can pull off a move like that and you have all the salary cap room to absorb that, you know, that's another way to get there. Um, so I think I, I'm glad that they're keeping themselves flexible for the future. Uh, you look at this free agent market, you know, they had a hundred million dollars. There weren't a hundred million dollars worth of guys that were worth no, signing for this team. That's nope. just, um, so I, I'm not mad at it. I, what I will say though, cause I know I've been very nice to the front office here. I do have some criticisms. Yeah. Um, 
and this is something that Mike Reese talked about in his column yesterday, his Sunday notes. He talked about how it seems like they're shifting away from building around special teams. You know, Matthew Slater retiring. We assume Brendan Schooler will fill that role, but who's filling yeah. the Brendan Schooler role? Um, Adrian Phillips cut Chris Board, cut Miles Bryant, who's a big special teamer for them, as well as a defensive player, not signed. He's in Houston now, which I'll talk about the defensive implications there in a sec too, but the NFL is looking at making the kickoff a bigger part of the game. Like they want to bring the kick return back. It hasn't been voted through yet. It sounds like it might still get voted through for this season. And I don't know how I feel about that. I think it's a bold decision to shift away from special teams. The second that it becomes a bigger part of the game, especially when we've seen this team lose because of special teams like multiple times in yeah. the recent past. I mean, they missed for all of the awful Matt Patricia stuff in large part. They missed the playoffs that year in large part because of special teams not executing in Buffalo. Like sure. that's, that was a huge thing. Um, did you go along with that? You know, it's still just Chad Ryland on the roster. There's kickers out there. They haven't signed anybody and I get a lot of off season left. You know, they're not in a rush to do it, but has, that situation hasn't gotten talked about at all. So, I really am unsure about the way they're going because I know there's been a lot of you know, the, the talk radio types who have poo pooed their investment in special teams over the years for a long time. And if they're just reacting to that and saying, we're going to spend less money there, we're going to invest less there. I don't, I don't like that process that you're taking that input from what the fans are saying on something yeah. like that. And I don't love the overall strategy of becoming less invested in something as it may become more important. And you're not wrong. I will say, though, Matt makes a good point that – not you, Matt. This Matt, <laughs> Matt makes a good know, point yeah. that, uh, that you know, the special teams sucked the last two years. And yeah. that was with those guys. But they Right now, a- I know Chris Board was one year, right? And But, you know, but the idea is that the special teams hasn't been good. And so – No, it hasn't. Those guys aren't the reason that you're going to do well on special teams, in my opinion, right? And so you can bring in some guys to replace them. I do think Miles Bryant, you mentioned Miles Bryant, and, you know, people know I hate Miles Bryant, but I don't. And this is the thing. I really started to gain some respect for Miles Bryant, certainly over the last year. And, and I think the reason for that is because they were playing him out of position. And it wasn't fair to him to be in the role that he was in because that's he can't do that. If you want to have him as a depth slot corner, he's pretty good. He's pretty good. He's not great, but he's pretty good. He's smart. He doesn't make stupid mental mistakes. Yeah. Now, he's not good enough to cover a lot of guys. They put him one-on-one on uh, who the hell is the, the fast wide receiver that played in Buffalo? Who's not there anymore? Who oh, just my absolutely torched them. Isaiah McKenzie. Yeah. Isaiah McKenzie just – Absolutely torched him all over. He can't do that. He can't cover that guy one on one, right? This is not possible. And so they put him in an impossible situation right there, and he didn't hold up. And so he looks terrible. But in actuality, he's a good player. And so I liked having him as a depth. He's now he's a depth guy. So like, maybe he didn't want to come back. Maybe he wanted to change the scenery. Maybe the Patriots were like, "Hey, look, we have some depth guys that we like here. We're good to go." Like, you know, I don't know, but he's a better player than. Certainly, I first thought, and I think that a lot of people think um, because of that. And so, mm-hmm. you know, it's it's one of those things for me that I look at it and say, okay, let, you know, let's see what what can happen over there. And, of course, you have Marcus Jones, who I love, and, you know, you do have Isaiah Bolden, who, you know, was hurt all of the year this year. Now, he obviously is a very different player than, um, than Brian, but still, you have guys that are depth pieces and Alex Austin who played well last year. So I think they saw enough from their young guys that they feel like they're okay at the corner position, but it's certainly just, something to keep an eye yeah. on. Well, and, and depth at the corner was a big issue for them last year. And right. Miles Bryant being able to give them something pretty consistently over the middle of the field as a defender was why they were able to stay competitive in some of yeah. those games. Yeah, that's true. Um, and like, I don't know, he's not, he's never going to be more than your third best defensive back or corner on the field. Like he's just not that kind of guy. Right. But he's also, I'm assuming we don't have numbers yet. He's also not going to get paid more than that. He is a role player. And for not that much money to get a guy who can be your corner four, who can be also kind of be your third safety in that, who can play in that role. Can also play a ton for you on special teams. Um, 
raises the floor of your defense, is a good communicator and helps the guys around him, especially if you're bringing in young players. I'm not sure why we're why we're in a rush to get rid of that. And it sounds like yeah. they weren't they were interested in bringing him back, but not that interested. And it I just seems strange. And it's won't tell it's me you're weird. interested. Like if they say something like we're interested in bringing him back, the contract's gonna be nothing. It's not like he got paid in yeah. well, and it's and so, you can you know if you're overpaying for Miles Bryant, we're talking probably hundreds of thousands of dollars, not millions Correct. of dollars. Yes. So exactly. uh yeah, that's an area where I don't mind overpaying a tiny bit to get a guy who's you know a good leader in the yeah, locker you room. Know, you know, he's a good play. player. You know, he's a good leader. You know, he's a decent depth guy. Again, we're not breaking the bank for this guy. He's not starting for you, but he's a no. good. He's a quality depth piece for you. And if you know what you have in him, versus drafting some guy in the fifth round who like who knows what that's you know. So th yeah. those are the things for me that, you know, I don't know. And again, and not only saying they want more speed of corner, I've seen a few people say JC Jackson, but like, I, I just, I don't I see JC Jackson happening. Um, yeah. Gilmore, I would be on board with that hundred percent. Yeah. Cause if it's um, Gilmore outside with uh, Gonzalez across from him, Jonathan Jones in the slot, I like that. Um, yeah. That'd be nice. When I, and I think the other thing here is it goes to the guy who's right behind you there on that wall. What do they get from Marcus Jones next year? He is right. still, but he played two and a half games this season. Yeah, and he, he had the same looked, injury that um that Christian Gonzalez like, had. But the, and he the, looked he looked good in that span. Uh, he's the right. kind of guy you draft when you're in a division with Tyree Kill and Jalen Waddle, exactly. And Garrett Wilson, and like I like that. But he's still, you know, we're two seasons in, and he's an undersized guy, and he got hurt. And he's still question marks, and he could turn into a starter for them this year, and it wouldn't surprise me. And if he's the kind of guy that hangs around as a returner the next two seasons and doesn't get extended um, and they let him walk. That's also not really surprising. You know, this can still go a lot of directions. Right. Um, and it seems like, you know, Christian Gonzalez, we like, though he's still unproven. Jonathan Jones is a little bit older and he's had his injury issues. And after that, there is no floor on this secondary. Marcus no. Jones, still a question mark. Alex Austin, a question mark. I thought uh, he, played, Wilson he played well last not, year. But like, but yeah. still, that small, was in limited sample. time, small sample size. Like, it's hard to yeah. know what you're going to get from him. But I yeah. do like the idea of giving him a shot this year. And this Marco Wilson, he ended up in New England because teams didn't want him. Uh, yeah. Although he did, I, he was a popular claim, I believe, on the waiver wire. Um, uh, and who, Isaiah Bolden, like he didn't. It's, it's day three pick, he didn't look like anything special in the preseason when he, he has, played. And the thing about the so the thing that excites me about Bolden is that he has the physicality to do it. He's got the physical yeah. skills to do it. Now, whether he can actually, whether the technique can actually ever catch up and he can actually ever do it, I don't know. But he has the speed and athleticism to be able to do it. So that at least excites you because he's got the size, he's got the length, he's got the speed, those things he has. And so you're like, should oh. be a press, should be a press yeah. out there. It certainly there. seems yeah, like it, right? And so, you know, and again, I don't know if that's ever going to come, if if the, you know, if the, the actual like technique of it is ever going to come, but there's a chance at least. Yeah. Is Sean Wade still around for next year? I think he might be as well. I think so. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Which he, you know what? He improved this past year. He still wasn't mm -hmm. anything fantastic, yeah. but uh, playable. But like Miles Bryant was better than Sean Wade by quite a quite yeah, a margin in my sure. eyes. Yeah, for sure. And I just, you know, I, this seems like a risky move and one where now you feel like you might have to draft a corner at some point. Letting yeah. Miles Bryant walk for what we think is pennies and right. a lot of needs on this well, team. But again, just if fill that one for cheap for two years and draft a corner next year. And yeah, I, I just think you know, if you're looking at it and saying, you know, and I don't know how much you got paid, but if you're looking at it and saying yeah. Christian Gonzalez, maybe they're playing on signing Steph. I don't know. But even if they're not, Christian Gonzalez, Jonathan Jones, Marcus Jones, maybe they're comfortable with um, with Alex Austin right there. And then you got Isaiah Bolden as your fifth. And Sean Wade is in there as your sixth. And, and you have so you have some depth guys and you're going to draft someone you know, end of day two or day three to try to be a guy that can be a deaf guy as well. I, I think that that's okay. Um, but, you know, I, I don't know. It, it's, I, I mean, time will tell, obviously, right? If they go out and sign Stephon Gilmore, I obviously feel very different about it. And there's been some smoke about that perhaps happening. And so, um, 
but we'll see. He did not have a ninety percent completion percentage on him. That's not correct. Well, and it's the way maybe that that Miles, might have been passer rating. That's totally different, though. Like Miles Bryant defended a lot of guys who were like underneath. So his job was like, yeah, you can give up the completion that's two yards and then wrap them up. Correct. Yeah, and that's yeah. fine. Um, which like which he wasn't. The, he's not an elite corner. He's just like you know another Kyle Aring. Now he's not a very different athlete than Kyle Arrington. Of course, but yeah, a similar yeah. role on the team. Right. Right. So, all right, let's get into this hip drop is driving me. I okay. just – you tweeted it out like five days ago, and it's so perfect that, you know, <laughs> the NFL is going to is gonna do it because, you know, they're going to change the rules because Warren Sharp doesn't understand football. Like, it's just yeah. – the hip drop tackle, I don't understand how are you supposed to tackle. Like, well, how, is- how am I going to – like, if I wrap you up at the waist, how do I bring you down? Do I have to like suplex you over my head? Like I don't understand how I'm supposed to bring you down. Well, they, well, they the way the rule is written, and this is one of the issues right off the bat, is they aren't banning the hip drop tackle. They're banning the swivel hip drop tackle, which is a particular variation of it. And like there are some plays where I can see what they mean because there's some plays where it's like it's clear yeah. with a defender. What they're trying to ban is a defender grabbing the um the the offensive player and then kind of just leaping up and jumping onto his legs to bring him down and like I right. get why you're trying to ban that but we're I mean, these things happen so fast and I I don't trust that the refs are going to be able to get this right consistently because we're talking about such a nuanced rule in a game that happens so fast and, you know these players aren't trying to do that they're not trying to hurt other guys right and if the players have a hard time doing this in real time, the rest are also going to have a hard time figuring this out in real time. Mm -hmm. Then the other part of this is that we all know the commentators aren't going to have any clue what's going on. That's correct. And you know, what's going to happen is I was went back and forth with somebody on on Twitter about this earlier today. Like, you know, we're going to get a moment where there's a tackle. that is very obviously a clean tackle, but it is from behind and you're going to get Chris Collinsworth or, you know, Tony Romer or one of those guys like, well, Jim, I don't know about a tackle that's very legal, but because they right. don't understand what the rule is, now everybody who's watching the game is confused. Um, yeah, it's just so – It drives me yeah. – that drives me crazy. And I'll tell you, like, you know, Greg Thompson, friend of the show, Greg Thompson, uh, who's been on before from Cover One, he tweeted out the, uh, the, the blue dress, the blue dress versus the gold dress, and they were like, you know – He's like, this is the NFL refs like trying to trying to decipher whether what's a hip drop tackle, and you know, and then he's the Laurel Yanny thing. I don't know if you guys remember these oh, viral the things. Or you know, it's all the same thing. Like you know, uh, after a view, the uh, the person was saying Laurel and not Yanny, and so therefore it's a fifty yard penalty. Like it we're, just, it's impossible. It's, it's impossible it. to stop these guys. And again, like. How do you know what's a hip drop and what isn't? I guess the swivel, I get it, right? It's, you don't want to, like, gator twist them, I suppose. But, like, did anyone do that? Like, was the Mark Andrews little, tackle this year? Was that a – did he swivel yes. him down? And that's, like, their example, which, like, I kind of see. But, like, they played a video of, like, tackles that fit the definition for this. And you watch the tackles, and, like, half of them did not fit the definition that they gave out. And it's, like – has no idea. What are we – so what are we – Here's I, the reason I why. It, and I get, I get what? Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Well, no, like I get the idea. I, I understand how certain tackling forms can be dangerous. I just feel like we're, we're taking a very, very, very fringe case, and we're mm-hmm. gonna turn a mountain, or a molehill, into a mountain here. With, yeah. Here's the reason why. Are right, you ready? All right, buckle up, buckle up, ladies and gentlemen. Here you go. Here it is, right here. And this is why the NFL is changing the rule. This is why the NFL has added more fines lately. Remember, the, remember last year, the last two years, you, they've guys have gotten fines for putting their head down. I mean, it's the, the, the stupidest rules of all time, and they're getting fined $30,000, and here's why. Do you know where those fines go? It's charity, right? Yeah, well, kind of. They go to retired players. They go into the fund that mm-hmm. pays out retired players. Okay. Oh, oh, that's it. So the NFL is trying to give – Retired players more money, but they won't pay them more money. <laughs> so they're stealing, stealing. They're stealing money from current offense, current NFL players to give to retired NFL players. And they're they're what they're doing, 
right? What they're doing is they're doing it under the guise of player safety, which is even more laughable. And it's so well, and it's the no... NFL being cheap. It's the NFL, the multi-billion dollar company being cheap and having their current mm-hmm. players pay for their retired players. Well, there's like no recourse for if you get fined, right? As far as I know, because like some of these fines are like, like, I get it. Like there's some, there's some plays where it's like, hey, the refs miss it and it deserves a fine. Right. And then, but you got guys posting clips of the plays that were actually fined. And it's like, there's literally just a regular football play. Nothing happened that even comes close to violating the rules. So Right. Yeah, and that's well. That's um, who's the running back from uh, Pittsburgh? Jalen uh, Warren. Jalen Warren. I I just never forget. Like uh, Matt Chatham posted a video, and he was like, "Jalen Warren was fined thirty thousand dollars for this play." It was pass goes, blocking, I think. Yeah, right? and he goes, "If you don't know who Jalen Warren is, you're never going to be able to find it. Never. Yeah, you, you can watch this a million times. You're never going to be able to find it. Yeah, and so right, it's yeah. just it it's crazy. And it's like that's the type of stuff where it's like. Unless it's egregious, what are we doing? So, like, what see, are you do doing? You, see, do you know what I, I I think the NFL's real agenda here? I don't think they're being cheap. I think the goal here is to do something the players are going to hate so that when the next <laughs> CBA comes around, they can be like, oh, yeah, you know, we'll yeah. we'll give we'll you take, that process uh, you wanted to appeal for fines and to get some of this stuff overturned. Right. So just give us the 18th game. Like that's. I feel like that. Maybe I'm getting too conspiracy theorist. Uh, you're not wrong. No, I'm that that makes like, that makes that's... quite a lot of sense too. Yeah, um, but yeah, the other thing, like with with this, somebody mentioned how you're gonna tackle Josh Allen. That dude, every time he gets sacked from behind, is gonna be like throwing his legs backwards to make 100%. it look like it's 100%. a swivel drop tackle, and at least once they're gonna fall for it, and right. like he's gonna get a free first down in the game somewhere, and we're all gonna be annoyed on Twitter. Like somebody clip this, bro. 30, 31 minutes into this, yeah. somebody clip this because yeah. we're gonna be bringing this back up in September, October, November because it's gonna happen. Yeah. And, right. well, well, the other thing is, it's either going to be that or they're just never going to call it. And there's going to be one play where somebody actually does get hurt on it and they're still not going to call it. And we're all going to be sitting here like, well, what was the point of all of this? Right. Because um, with the NFL, there's no, I mean, we remember the pass interference stuff, how they instituted the pass interference challenge. And for like a month, it was good. And then the refs just decided we're not going to overturn this no matter what on challenges. And then for the rest of the year, nothing happened. And then they just got rid of the rule. Yeah. So, well, and I think too, like one of the things that I do like that they brought in, which is nice, is that the booth can review some plays, right? Mm-hmm. Some plays, which is nice, right? Intentional grounding, they can review. Uh, roughing the passer, right? Is it that they can review? There's a few okay. things that they can review that's obvious. And, it, and it, not sub, like not subjective things. Uh, right. Like, Which you know, is nice. Parts of this. And that's good to see because some of those things, I, I look at it and say, okay. And, and I like the fact that it's coming from the booth because it's like, is it obvious? Yes. Okay. Here's the right call. Bam. We're done. Let's not stop yeah. time to do this. Like, is it obvious? Yes, it is. All right. That should have been the call. Or – you I screwed agree. that call up. You got the call wrong. You called it, you know, intentional grounding. It yep. wasn't. What are we doing? I think – I agree. And I think, you know, they should expand what's revo- reviewable and cut down on the amount of time that you have to yeah. actually do the reviewing um, right. and get more people involved in the process too. Because if we're, if we're doing something that's like procedural, like, you know, an exact yard line for something we're not looking at like a first down, but just like, you know, just double checking something or doing a clock thing or something like that. Like, that's the kind of thing where you can get somebody in a booth in New York who works for the NFL to look at it, take 15 seconds, look at it and be like, hey, here's where it is. Why, uh, we don't, why can the and, NHL do it and the NFL can't? I don't understand why the NHL well, do it and the, N- and the NFL can't. It doesn't make any well, sense. Is, well, how many times in the, part of this is with March Madness happening now and all of the reviews that you get in college basketball yeah. has, has ticked me off with this too. But yeah. it's like, how can we as fans see something super clearly on the first or second replay of this show on TV? And then it takes two and a half more minutes before the official makes a call and announces it. Let's hurry it up. And if it takes you two and a half minutes to think, first of all, some of these should not take you two and a half minutes. Correct. Yeah. But if it does, it's not obvious, and you shouldn't be overturning it. It should be that simple. And this is another thing where having people in a booth can help. If you got somebody upstairs who's watching the game, you don't even. Sometimes you might not even really have to stop play that much. 
you can you know you can do it within the flow of the game to review right. these things like they've done with reviewing every single scoring play um, yeah which you don't even really notice now unless it's the ones where you knew it was going to be close anyway well and, and um, that's that's like the that. other that's the other part of it is that it doesn't matter the refs on the field don't have to make any decisions at all they don't have to make one decision have the guys in the booth make decision, and DJ Daniel says it might be the ref union, and it certainly might be the referee union. But like, uh, but I just I, it, I don't get that because you know. this is this is an opportunity for more refs. We can get an extra ref right. in every game and have it be somebody upstairs. Like yeah, that should be it. a good thing for everybody involved, and it's extra insulation in the public eye for these guys because there's less right. pressure on getting it. And it's you know this is what I think about is like you go back to the past Chiefs game in 2019 with Nikhil Harry stepping out in that whole thing. Something like that, which CBS cuts to the first replay and we all see what happened. There should just be an easy recourse to be like, hey, you know, we all saw what happened. We're going to, we're going to. Wasn't that a situation though where the Patriots had no timeouts and so they couldn't challenge it or they were out of challenges? I think the Patriots Um, couldn't challenge it. They were out of challenges. But what I'm saying is for something like that, it shouldn't come down to a challenge. No, I get you. That clear and obvious. Have a guy who's watching it and who sees the feed and who goes, oh, we're going to change this real quick. Or like, right. Everybody who's watching. Yeah, and everybody who's watching March Madness Friday night saw that block that was ruled a foul oh, that or brutal. the Thursday night or whenever that was. And it's yeah. like I feel the whole I feel like sports in general would be way better for the officials and for the fans if there was mm-hmm. somebody who was watching like the TV feed or whatever who saw what the fans are seeing and right. could help make a couple calls or you know Right. And it's this and is, this isn't gonna be more than a once a week thing either. Right. And and Very to your different. point, it's not the subjective ones. It's not the well. He hit him, but it wasn't serious contact. Just no, 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 no. It's he didn't even touch him. You called yeah. the foul or you called the penalty, and it never happened. It wasn't there. Like, yeah. so let's fix it, right? Now you can make an argument that there's, you know, I don't want someone in the booth saying, Well, yeah, but did he, you know, did he, he kind of touch him? Did he not touch him? I don't, you know, he got him, but did it really affect him? I don't want that. I don't want that. I don't want to deal with that, right? Like if he if he hit him, he hit him. You want to call it? They call it fine. But you know, if the guy didn't get touched, what are we talking about? You know, so th- those are the things that I think yep. that we can we can kind of go from there. You know what I mean? Yeah, and it's uh, like go to the Saints Rams NFC Championship game and the pass interference that wasn't yep. called. Yep. That's one of those things. It's like, hey, somebody can be like, hey, this is you know pretty pretty obvious. We're gonna you call down to the head ref. This is one we're gonna intervene on. We're gonna throw a flag here and then yeah, yep. and this is. I mean, we're talking about calls from 2018 and 2019 right now. That's how infrequent yeah. these things actually happen in games. I don't think most people are only going to notice this when it's a good thing. And I think it's right. you know, DJ in the chat is saying uh, refs might not like it because they lose authority. And I understand that. But I also think refs might like it because it means they are less, um, they get a little more margin for error. Yep. They can make a mistake and it won't cost the game because there's some kind of a, a safety blanket there. And, um, I, I'll know, tell you what, I'll tell you what, I think, I think they would be a lot more amenable to it if we got rid of the pool reporters and they had to actually address the media. And I don't think that will ever happen, but if they had to actually get up and address the media after a game, the head ref had to go out and address the media, they'd be okay with it. Well, well and this <laughs> you know is, what I mean? was, was also the hard thing with it is that obviously I like that idea, but also if you have refs who go in front of the press and can't defend their calls, then the second that that ref gets assigned to your team, Correct. you're throwing a, a, a fit over the fact that yeah. it happened. Yeah. So it's, um, I don't know. No, I agree. It's, it's a tough situation. No. I just I think it's unfair to the refs to put them in a position where they actually have a worse view of what's going on than almost every single person who watches the game because everybody else gets it on TV. Right. Right. I agree. All right. Yeah. Let's, let's take a break and we'll get into um, what's do that. We want to talk, do we want to Damien Harris? Do we want to talk in that real, real oh, quick here? Damien Harris retired. I like Damien yeah. Harris. Good player, but like he had, he had a neck injury last year. So I'm assuming that's, yeah, I would think that that has something to do with it, right? He doesn't want to mess with things. Um, you know, might be an injury, might not necessarily be an injury. He might be cleared medically to play and just said, no, nah, I'm not messing with it. I'm all set. You know, I don't yeah. know. Um, but, you know, yeah, good fan, good it, player. But, I mean, he was here for in Buffalo in 2021, so. Yes, which was nice, right? And But he was drafted in, was he drafted in 2020 by the Patriots? Or 2019? I think it was 2019. 
I think it was he must have been 2019. I think yeah. it was a third round pick in 2019, I think. Yeah. Um because right. was Mondre drafted in 2020? Mondre was 2020, yeah. 2020. And I think or, Harris was, was 2019. Or was Mondre 21? Now I'm getting myself all messed up. Yep, 19 third round. I knew I knew someone in the chat, two people in the chat, Matt, Manito, and and Thad helping us out. Appreciate you. And Mondre was Mondre was 21, fourth yeah. round 2021. Yeah. Yeah, so, two okay. years apart. So, yeah. Hey, they're they're pretty well. I'd say they're due for drafting another running back. I think we know that anyway, especially with yeah the last two guys they drafted not working out. <laughs> Quite true. Quite true. All right, so let's take it. Let's take a quick break. We'll come back. Um, we'll talk about my draft, uh, my mock draft, which came out today on Pat's pulpit, and we'll also discuss uh, some listener mocks that we had submitted as well. Football season may be over, but the action on the floor is heating up. Whether it's tournament season or the fight for playoff home court, there's no shortage of high-stakes basketball moments this time of year. Get in on the excitement with Prize Picks, America's number one fantasy sports app, where you can turn your hoops knowledge into serious cash. Now, Prize Picks even offers injury insurance so your entries stay in play, even if one of your players gets injured. For basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and does not return in the second, that player projection won't count against you, and the rest of your entry stays live. Now, this week for me, I have Steph Curry for more than 29 points and Nicole Yochis for more than 10 rebounds, and then Caitlin Clark for more than 30 points and LeBron James for more than 7 assists. So download the app today and use the code CLNS for a first deposit match up to $100. Prize picks. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy. All right, so uh, Old Man Mob's asking about whether the Patriots will trade Ramondre Stevenson or not. I, I cannot, cannot okay. believe that they would trade no. Ramondre. Um, so, but I mean, well, you know, I suppose you never know, but I'd be shocked if they did that. He's literally their best offensive player, <laughs> so I can't imagine that they would trade him. Yeah, I, I know and they, they might. They might not resign him, but I don't think they're right. going to trade him. And that's the thing. I know he's up after the next year, but like you're not going to get a lot for him either. So it's not like, you know, if you were getting a, a, a early second round pick or something like that, that'd be a different story. You're not. You're going to get like a fifth round pick back for Ramondre. It, it's, so like, it's not worth it. He's one of those guys who like, if he has a really good season and you're at the trade deadline, there's a playoff team that lost their running back and somebody's going to give you like a third for him for half a season. Yeah. Right. Well, at least I'm, I'm thinking about that. Um, Correct. But I don't yeah. think, I, yep. I don't think he's, his stock would get that high. And they, agreed. But the money they have, I think I would rather just resign him after two. <laughs> yep. Not only hooking us up with a little thumbs up, appreciate that. Thank Give you. the channel a thumbs up. Uh, Space Cadet asked about Judon. No chance. No chance. J Matthew Judon has, mm -hmm. has talked about being a Patriot, is the consummate Patriot, continuously trying to get people over here to New England. Like, you know, he's a Patriot. They're keeping him here. So uh, that's the way it goes. All right. You want to get into uh, – let's do the listener mocks first, and then we'll go through my mock. What do you think about that? Let's do it. Let's do it. Which one do we? Uh, you got any preferences here on what we're going to uh, start? It doesn't with? matter. Whichever one you want. Now we'll go. We'll go from from the top here. We didn't. We didn't get all of them included in this one. We're going to have a couple from this. That I think we're going to have next yeah. week. Um, well, I'll start with the first one here from Thaddeus Skywalker. That that has one in every single week. I don't think anybody's. Sure yeah, his, his numbers are up there. Uh, this one from Thad. He has Drake May. At pick three, a trade back in the second round with Keon Coleman being taken at pick 37. Offensive tackle Patrick Paul at pick 68. Cornerback DJ James from Auburn at 103. Safety Dadrian Taylor Demerson from Texas Tech at 114. Theo Johnson at 137. Ray Davis, the running back at 153. And Ladarius Henderson from the Michigan offensive line at 180. What do you think, Pat? Uh, I mean, I like it. You know, it's 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 pretty good. I, Keon Coleman, I like I like him at thirty seven a heck of a lot better than people are talking about in the twenties or you know in the teens or whatever. So I like Keon Coleman. I, I'm worried about his separation numbers. Um, I worry about that. Very good contested catch guy, monster mm -hmm. uh, at times at Florida State, but I worry about the separation numbers. Um, I am sold. I'm sold on Drake May uh, at three. I think it makes sense. I think he might be the quarterback of the future, and if that's the case, taking him at three makes a ton of sense. I like Patrick Paul a lot too. Um, and so, you know, you draft a corner in DJ James, you draft a safety, you draft a tight end, you draft a running back, and then you draft an offensive lineman. I like it. So, Yeah, 
Yeah, good. And I got I gotta watch that safety. I haven't checked him out. Uh, obviously, with Jonathan Jones, that had good luck with the Auburn corners. So yep. I haven't gotten into his tape either. I haven't gotten into much defensive tape this cycle yet. Um, yeah, but yeah. Well, I love the positions there. Yep, agreed. Uh, next up, Gavin Gardner sending us one. We got we got a couple trades in this one. Uh, Patriots trade with the Vikings back to eleven, uh, and they are going to get Olu Fashanu at eleven which I think would be awesome. And they also pick up 23 and a couple other pick, future first, future fifth, I think, in that trade. Uh, then they're going to trade back again from 23 back to 27, get A.D. Mitchell at 27, Michael Penix at 34, Max Melton, the corner from Rutgers at 80, Trey Benson, the running back from Florida State at 103, Theo Johnson, a favorite in here, Another one. 121, Christian Boyd from Northern yeah. Iowa. At 137, uh, Roger Rosengarten, the tackle at 145. Nehemiah Pritchett, the corner at, I think that's 162. Uh, Jordan Jefferson, the defensive lineman at 180. And CJ Hansen, the guard from Holy Cross at 214. Yeah, I like it. I mean, I love, you know, Olo's a beast. Um, yeah. I don't know if AD Mitchell's going to be there at 27, but I like the idea of moving back down again, picking up some extra assets. Penix, I had in one of my drafts. I love him. Uh, I'm a big fan of him. I worry, I worry so much about his knee, um, mm. and I also worry about not only his knee, but also the ability to, you know, throw the ball over the middle of the field and read and everything else. You know, I, but I do like him. I just, I don't know how. At 34. I feel good about that. I agree with you. I agree, yeah. and I like the rest of the draft too. I mean, Trey Benson, I think, makes a ton of sense. Um, there's some injury question marks about him too, but if you're comfortable with the medicals, he's a heck of a running back. Yep. Yep. I like, um, I like Christian Boyd here. Who's a guy they've been tied to as well. Yeah. I think I could see doing him liking him. He was good at, at the senior ball. I think with the senior ball at I'm Roger Rosengarten is a right tackle who seemed like a, a guy who could be a really high quality swing tackle for you. And I like that, especially because, you know, Obviously, we're excited that Michael Wenu is going to be your right tackle full time. But in a world, you know, if injuries happen or whatever, if you got right. a quality tackle backup, that allows you to shift him back inside if needed. You know, it allows you to take advantage of his versatility. And we all know they need more depth to tackle. So getting two tackles, uh, the, the high upside Fashanu and the high floor Rosengarten, um, I, I really like that pairing. Yeah, I like it too. And and look, you know, not only just saying that Theo's only good at testing and his production was terrible and he's super slow at turning and all this stuff. That that's a hundred percent true. And I don't bl- I agree with you. But tight end is a position that's filled with guys who did nothing <laughs> in college and developed into something in the pros. That just fit that the tight end position is filled with guys like that. And so, you know, you're j- taking them in what, the fourth, fifth round in this mock? Like I'm okay with taking a flyer in the fourth or fifth round than a guy that has, you know, elite athleticism. Even if the production isn't there, even if he's not a good tight end right now, we can develop into one. Yeah, and it's if you look at the way tight ends develop in the NFL. Like it's a it could be a two, three, four year development yep. curve before these yep. guys become starters. So I, I think Theo Johnson is a guy who you're you're drafting him, hoping that in 2026 he's one of your starters that's yeah that's correct. the idea there um Maybe. and it's something about tight end these guys they just take longer to develop pretty yeah. much across the board with a couple of notable recent exceptions i think sam laporta is a guy who really stands out there dalton kincaid but those are also guys who are primarily um you know well even even tight ends yeah, yeah even Pitts and Pitts has gotten chat on but like he had a thousand yards this rookie year so like and you know, he's a good, injuries. he's a good receiver. He's just, yeah, he dealt with injuries and that offense was terrible. So, yeah. um, all right, what do we got? What, what's up next? Uh, this one is from Andrew Campanella. He also does a trade back here with Minnesota and a second trade back with the Raiders. The first pick here is at 13 Patriots take Troy Fontenot tackle from Washington and their AD Mitchell this time at 29 with another trade back in there. Tackle Karan Amagaji at 59. Michael Penix at 61 in this month. 61. Uh, Tavondre Sweat, defensive tackle from Texas at 68. Jacob Cowing, receiver from Arizona at 103. Cam Hart, the corner from Notre Dame at 109. I think that is 108. Uh, Isaac Garendo, 
halfback from Louisville at 137, Tip Raymond, tight end from Illinois at 180, Frank Gore Jr., the halfback. You know he played halfback mm -hmm. from Southern Miss there in the sixth round, and Jalen Green, uh, edge defender from James Madison in yeah. the seventh. I'm going to confess, I, I have not – I have nothing I can give you on Jalen Green. I do not know who that is. But the rest of this draft well, I like. Well, you know what's interesting? I can give you something on Jalen Green. I'm going to save that for later, though. That's a, that's what we call a big market tease. I'm going to save that for later. Uh, but I like that pick. Um, I like this draft. You know, there's a lot of good players in the draft. I think Penix being there at 60 is wild, but it could happen. I think Sweat being there that late is not so. I, don't th I think there's a 0% chance that happens, but I guess you never know. But I... He is an absolute monster. If he's not gone by the end of the second round, I don't. I don't know anything about anything. Like it's just, what are you doing? You know, you got to draft that guy. So, um, and he's a guy that, like, if I were the Patriots and he's sitting and you're in the fifties and he still was on the board, I would take sixty eight and package it with something and go get him because he's that good. That like you put him next to a guy like Christian Barmore, oh my god, you know. So, um, so it's interesting. Now the Penix thing is interesting because. Not elite saying they don't like Penix, uh, and and he's right. Mayo said there were five quarterbacks. Now he didn't say who the five quarterbacks were, but he said there were five quarterbacks. Um, and they haven't been linked to Penix. They haven't met with Penix. None of that. You go back and forth. Here's the thing. I just is it a smoke screen? Do they really like Penix? And they're just trying to get people off the scent. I don't know. Like right now is silly season. Like. There's there's certainly a chance that the Patriots are in on Michael Penix and they just don't want to tell anyone that that's the case. You know that they're hoping if they make that trade with you know Minnesota to do 11 and 23 that they can draft Michael Penix at 23. I don't know, but like I think that there's a chance that, that that's what they want to have happen and they don't want anything linking them to Michael Penix at all. Well, well they also, you know, they got ties to Washington now with Tyler Hughes being yep. there. Yep. Um, and they may feel like they can get a lot of good intel from him. Um, and, you know, they could still do a pre-draft beating with Penix. They can bring him in to Foxborough if they want. Um, you know, there's they can meet with him still if they'd like to. So, yeah. yep. um, but okay. I also, you know, with his injuries, I wouldn't be surprised if he's a guy who's also totally off their board towards this year because of the injuries. And yeah. that wouldn't shock me. Um, also, what we're talking about, you know, where the QBs are ranked at the top, I thought it was interesting. Derek Klassen. Who evaluates QBs? Mm -hmm. it's, I had just come on here last Thursday and said I'm not at all interested in Spencer Rattler. He said based on the tape, he thinks Spencer Rattler is his QB five in this draft. Well, look um, at that. So look you know that's that. something he's yeah, smarter than I am. Too. So I might have to go back and take a look at yeah. this and yeah, evaluate some of it. But um, interesting. When, the other note on this before we get to the next one: there's a lot of smoke around JJ McCarthy at two now. I don't, I don't buy it. I think it's people just making stuff up, but um, it's interesting at least. Yeah. Yep. I agree. So uh, the draft starts at two. I mean, obviously we know who's going number one right now, and no one has any idea what Washington's doing at two, and then what Washington does at two is going to impact what the Patriots do at three. So it's going to be yep. really interesting to see what happens. And it, and we did see, you know, the guys, the team that picks, what, two, three, four, and five all come out in the last week talking about how they're open for business for trades. So, yep. Yep. Uh, yep. I haven't seen it quite like that before. It seems like teams are lining up to say, hey, Minnesota, we'll take your draft picks. Yeah, yeah. Uh, all right, one more here. This is from Ollie Dyer. He says, longtime listener from across the pond, wanted to send in a mock for us to critique slash laugh at. I don't think there's going to be too much laughing with this one, but we'll, 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 see, how, we'll see how Pat takes it. Uh, we've got a, a trade back to start with the Giants. Patriots are on the clock at sixth overall. They take Joe Alt. They are tackled from Notre Dame. In the second, you add Xavier Leggett from South Carolina. By the way, the trade back, you pick up a, a future first and a sixth rounder in it. Okay. Uh, third round, Max Melton, the corner from Rutgers. Fourth, it's uh, podcast hero Ben Sinnott, tight end from Kansas State. A fifth round, Luke McCaffrey, wide receiver from Rice. His comment says, double dip at receiver. Why not? Mm -hmm. And then sixth and seventh, you got A.J. Barner, Dylan Lauby, Tanner Bordellini, and C.J. Hansen. That's that's two C.J. Hansons today. Listen I got to me. I gotta take a look at this guy. This is this is just outright pandering. I mean, this guy is just I pandering right now. I mean, this is incredible. 
This is incredible. If the Patriots came away with this draft, like it'd be unreal, right? You're you're drafting who I've said on here, the safest player in the entire draft and Joe Walden, number six, and getting a future first round pick next year. You're drafting Leggett in the second round, who I think is a beast. Max Melton's a very good corner in the third round. Then you're drafting Ben Sinnott. I mean, we love Ben Sinnott. We all, everyone yeah. knows that. Then you get Luke McCaffrey and Dylan Lobby as well, and Tanner Bordellini. Are you <laughs> kidding me? This is we. This would be. This is this he is, wins all he wins well, the the draft of the week. This draft is just missing Eric Hall. That's it. Yeah, true, very true. <laughs> um, also, there's one. Okay. There's one more that uh, that Wes sent me. My buddy Wes, uh, who we read his on on the show last week, and he. I thought it was funny, so I just I just read it to you because it's fantastic. Mm-hmm. He called it the uh, "Who needs playmakers? We want beef" mock draft, and he <laughs> and no trades. He drafted Drake May at three, and then went all defensive and offensive line. Brandon Fisk, uh, Braden, I'm sorry, Braden Fisk at 34 from Florida State, just uh, a, a really good pass rushing interior defensive lineman. Uh, Kieran Amajigi from Yale at 68, another le- another tackle. Cedric Fran Pran, who is an interior offensive lineman from Georgia. Zach Zinter, who's an interior offensive lineman from Michigan. Tanner Bordellini, who's an interior offensive lineman from Wisconsin. <laughs> and then an Eds from Washington and an offensive tackle from South Dakota State. I just, I love the idea because he's just like, screw it. We're just drafting all big guys. The, the thing to know about Wes is that he is an offensive line coach. Uh, and so, you know. He likes the big guys up front. He he has a yeah. soft spot for the big guys, you know. But um, yeah. but you know, but I was like, oh my god, that's so funny. I love it. <laughs> so I, I so. Love it. well, you know, you gotta you gotta build the foundation. You know, you gotta yep. you gotta win on the line of scrimmage. I like, think most importantly, you can't lose on the line of scrimmage. Yeah. Like well, that's what the has. Lions did, right? The Lions the yeah. Lions have done that, right? They they have trade they've drafted a bunch of guys early on on both mm-hmm. the offensive and defensive line. You know, Penny Sewell. Number seven overall, they draft the number one pick. They draft Aiden Hutchinson. Like, you know, you have to be good on the two on the two lines. Now, I don't know if I'd go as far as West did uh, and draft all offensive and defensive linemen, but you know, like I think it's important to get to get some guys. So you know, and you want to remake. And I think that's you know one of the question marks we have going forward for this team is how do they view their line of scrimmage play going forward? You know, different coaches they might want to play differently on both sides of the ball and. Uh, if that's the case, I won't be surprised if they say, hey, we are just going to overhaul the line. We're going to draft, you know, two tackles, a guard, and a center this year. I don't think that's totally right. out of the picture. Agreed. It's the all-Nick team, as DJ Daniel says. All he's draft. Drafted yes, a bunch of Knicks. I like it. Thank you, everybody who sent one in. Uh, yes. What's the email for that, Pat? So it's Pat's Nation Podcast at – no, that's not – that's not my podcast. That's not right. Hold on. Hold, please. Pat's Nation Network – at gmail.com. It's all one word, Pat's Nation Network at gmail.com. So I try to I try to respond to everyone. Um I sign your name too, Matt, even though you don't do any work. Oh, well, you. you do the work. I send you the things and then you and then you make it look nice for the show. I actually <laughs> respond to the emails. Um, but I sign your name on it anyways, as if you're as if you're responding. But I you know, I speak for the two of us. Um, and so I appreciate you guys sending us in and you keep doing it because we got all week. And by the way, we're gonna get into my mock draft 3.0 right here. Yeah, let's do it. How about this? From now until the draft, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, you are going to get a mock draft on Monday morning every week. Oh, shoot. I might do for next Monday oh, already. Yes, you are, baby. Oh, boy. I we're going. Right. I absolutely love it. So we're going to go. So now so now until the end of the draft, now until draft day, we're going every we're going every, th- every Monday. It's going to be great. I'm going to love it. Um, so Matt's going to go this Monday. The Monday after Easter, which would be the first, I'll go the eighth. You go the fifteenth. I'll go the twenty second, and the draft's the twenty fifth. So, um, so yeah, so it'll be great. We'll get we'll get some we'll get some mocks in there, baby. So I love it. So all right, so here we go. So uh, here's what I had, and we we mentioned this before. All right, I'm sold on Drake May. I am. I'm sold on Drake May. The problem that I have is this: you don't know what Washington's doing it to. You just don't know what they're doing it to. And so I looked at it and said, okay, well, what if Washington takes Drake May at two and not Jaden Daniels? I'm not sold on Jaden Daniels at three. Now, the conversation is the conversation, right? You know, you need a quarterback. You don't need a quarterback. You need the right quarterback. 
I don't think Jaden Daniels is the right quarterback. He certainly might be. I might be wrong. You know, and if the Patriots draft him at three, I'll do my damnedest to, to, to believe that he's the right guy. I don't believe that right now. And so that's what I did uh, as I imagined that. Now, here's what I did. I added a little flavor to it. I sent three and 103 to Minnesota. They sent me back 1123 in their first round pick next year and two late fifth round picks. The reason I did that is because the two fifth round picks come out to a little bit less. Um, you really should be three fifth round picks. So I sent basically the equivalent of a late of a late fifth round pick to them to kind of put it over, you know, to, to add a little bit extra value to get that first round pick next year. That's that was kind of my thought there, um, and so that was that was the idea. So again, it ended up being three and one hundred three. For 11, 23, 157, 167 in their first round pick next year. So that's that's what it ended up being. So at 11, I took Brian Thomas Jr. out of LSU. Brian Thomas Jr., absolute stud wide receiver. In this mock, it was wide receiver and quarterback heavy. And so the first three guys are gone, obviously, right? And Brian Thomas, in my opinion, is right there in that second that second tier wide receivers. He might be number one on that second tier wide receivers. It might not be, but goes to the combine and runs a four, three, three at the combine. Um, you know, and, and at his size at six, three, two, ten, it's pretty impressive, you know, he and he reminds me a little bit, and it's a different type of receiver. But there's some T Higgins in his profile and that he's yeah. the number two guy behind a guy who's, you know, super explosive and the one that right. gets all the hype. Um, yeah who's also, you know, still a very, very good player. So, um, yeah, no, I like, uh, I, I like, I like him. Yeah. So, so that's what I did at 11 at 23. I took a Marius Mims from Georgia. He's an offensive tackle. He played offensive tackle at Georgia. Now he didn't play for very long. He started like nine games in his career, but he's a little bit of an older guy too. All right. But, the guy is an absolute freak. He's a freak. His arms are over 36 inches long. His wingspan is 87 inches. 87 inches. It's outrageous. He's 6'8", 340, ran a 5.0740-yard dash. Broad jump over 9 feet. At 6'8", 340 with a broad jump over 9 feet, that's outrageous. And so, you know... That's one of those things for me that I think Chucks might start the year at left tackle. And Mims may have to learn the position. He might have to get refined a little bit more. When you find an athletic freak at that size, it's awfully hard to pass up a guy like that with those traits. And so I figured late uh, late in the round uh, from there. So on Mims, and Mims is such a weird uh, prospect here because do you, do you know how many career snaps he has? Oh my God. It's not, it's not much because he only started like eight, eight or nine games, 803 snaps. That's oh according to God. PFF. It's not great. Like it's just, he's a total, it's a total projection. Like his tape's yeah. very good. He's a freak athlete. Just hasn't played a lot of football. Right. Um, you know, guys like that can turn into Trent Brown or they can turn into Trent Brown, you know? Yeah, whichever whichever side of Trent Brown <laughs> you're getting, I love that so much. That's so good. That's so good. We got to keep using that. That's so good. Yeah. Um, all right. In the second, I I traded 34 to Washington for 36 and 100. Um, and so I moved back two spots. In this mock, Washington, I think wanted to go up and get a get like a top flight receiver. They paid number 100. Now don't forget, we traded 103. So now we have that middle. We're not going from the third to the fifth. We have that fourth round pick, which is nice. Uh, and at 36, they drafted Bo Nix. Oh, God. I don't I, – listen. I just I, – I, I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't know. All right? I'm draft. I'm doing a ton of mock drafts, and I just feel like Bo Nix feels like a Patriots type of quarterback. He has a stronger arm than than Mac Jones does. He moves in the pocket significantly better than Mac Jones does. If we were just, if he had just gone to Oregon, if he had gone to Oregon and never played anywhere else and just been in Oregon, right? 
And that was it. That's the only tape we saw. He'd be a consensus top 10 pick. The problem is, is that he played at Auburn too, and he was freaking terrible at Auburn. And he and was, so, yeah. You know, and so There's then that's the tread question. on those tires. And so that's the problem. He's played a ton. He's an older guy. So it's like, what are you getting? Are you getting the Auburn Bonix or are you getting the Oregon Bonix? And that's that. That's where it becomes dangerous. Well, but I, if you're drafting at 36, I don't hate it. I could see him being a scheme fit too. Um, you know, it's a couple things to like there. When he's mobile, you can roll him around. He can throw on the yep. move. He is very consistently accurate with underneath throws. And good at setting guys up for yards after the catch. You mentioned his pocket presence. Uh, his pressure to sack rate is second in this in the, of these guys we're talking about in the draft, only behind Michael Penix. Yep. He is They're very, very good. Really he's a good big guy. body back there, too. So he's hard to bring down. He's elusive. He can make throws on the run. It's just, you know, his physical tools are a whole lot of good but not great. And he's already older. And he's ne- he like since Auburn, he hasn't really been asked to be in an offense where he's reading it down the field. Right. So this is a situation where you might be picking a guy whose ceiling is 20th best quarterback in the NFL, like a Baker Mayfield, like, but like, you know, the ups and downs of Baker Mayfield, like not just the good stuff we've seen. Yeah. And whose floor, you know, obviously you talk about floors with a quarterback. There is no floor. Any quarterback draft at any point in the league can be out of the league in three seasons. That's correct. But, um, and I, I, I like his floor. I think it's better than most because he's good under pressure and because he can consistently make throws underneath. I don't think he'll totally flame out, but you never know. Um, so I, I don't hate picking him. I think he'd be a good fit in the offense. I think getting an older guy in there is something they wouldn't hate either because he, it should give you, you know, if he, if it translates, he gives you an immediate step up. He would immediately yeah. be better than Mac Jones was, I think. Right. But this might be the type of thing where you're going to draft him and he's your starting quarterback for two, three years, and then you're looking for another guy. And it's not because he's bad, but it's because eh, he's he's all right. He's a backup. Yeah. yeah. No, and you're not wrong. And so Matt Menino, you know, says, says that uh, it strikes him as curious to think about a Patriots type of player when Belichick's no longer here. And you're not wrong, Matt. Mm-hmm. I just... I think he fits the scheme is what I'm what I'm trying to say. AVP I has – and not that AVP has a guy that he's looking for, but I, I just think that, you know, I think that, it, it you know, that's the only thing um, that I look at. So, yeah, yeah we'll see. And, and it's – yeah, like being able to – he checks all of, like, the basic boxes. He might right. never do anything other than the basic stuff. Correct. But getting a yeah. guy in there who can – I think – if he, again, like I said, if it translates, can immediately raise your floor and a guy who might be, you know, right away as good as Jacoby Brissett is too, that uh, means your quarterback room has two guys better in it than anybody you had last year. And that's improvement. And yeah. it also, I think, if they don't like the quarterback group next year, this allows you to kick the can down the road for two years while you figure it out and yeah, true. Um, have, a, you know, a playable offense while you figure it out. Yeah, no, that's a good point. All right, uh, 68, I went Kyrie Jackson out of Oregon. He's a he's a corner. I don't know if a lot of people have heard of him. 6'4", he's a massive dude, 6'4", 198. I don't know if he's going to translate to the exact type of offense the Patriots want to play. I don't know how well he's going to be in a man press defense. He's a bigger guy, but he's not the best at man press. He's all right. He's not the best at man press. I don't know if, if he's ever going to actually do that. Uh, well enough to play here, but I liked the idea. I wanted a corner at 68. I had to take someone different than I had already taken before. I liked the idea of taking a guy with the, the, you know, the quote unquote traits and the size. And so that's why I went with Kyrie Jackson. Again, he may not be the guy um, that the Patriots are interested in, but I do like the idea of getting a big, long guy that can, you know, that has some, has decent speed. He is a really interesting prospect too, because I think he's an older guy, and I think he has, I think he's bounced around a ton. I think he was at a JUCO at one point, and he was somewhere yeah. else, and he transferred to Oregon. Um, and you know, like he's guys like that are super variable in their draft stock. I don't know where he's going to go, but you look at the length and right you know, in a scheme where he can be your, I don't know, maybe not your Brandon Browner. I don't know if he's that kind of guy, but if. If Christian Gonzalez is going to be your guy who can consistently lock up number ones, then in theory, Jackson has the tools to be a number two who can be super physical and, and beat guys up on the other side. 
Yeah. Yep. Agreed. All right. Uh, pick 100. And this is the reason I traded for pick 100, by the way. Michael Hall Jr. out of Ohio State. By the way, 100 is a compensatory pick that Washington has. And so, therefore, it, it's technically a third-round pick. Um, Michael Hall Jr. out of Ohio State is an interior defensive lineman. But he's a pass rusher from the interior of the defense. Um, just got absolutely got after the quarterback last year uh, and the year before, I believe. So this is the year before, but he had 11.5% pressure percentage was aligned as a D tackle. Uh, that's an 0 to 4, uh, 4 I tech with a minimum of 100 rushes. Uh, led the Big Ten. So that's the type of thing where I'm like, whoa, like this dude, he can get after the quarterback. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's to me where it's like, you have Barmore and you have Keon white. And now you have another guy that can rush from inside. That's scary. And so that's why I like him here. I think 68 was a little too early for him. hundred to hundred, 103, I think is the, is the right spot for him. So I'm a fan of Michael Hall jr. Uh, at yeah. that, you know, that late third, early fourth round. Yeah, I think he'd be a stud there. I, I love this pick. Yeah. So uh, 137, I went Luke McCaffrey, who we already talked about on someone else's mock. But again, take it double dip at wide receiver. You need it. You need it. Their wide receiver room is is a disaster right now, so you need it. Um, yeah. 157, I took Jalen Simpson from Auburn. Now, Jalen Simpson is a guy that was a corner that's making the transition to safety. He did not make the transition to safety already. He was a corner at Auburn, but he's making the transition to safety for right, right now. They've liked what he's done in some of the bowls that they saw. Um, and so, you know, I think that they are. Oh, no, that's not true. I think he made the transition to safety last year. I don't know. I um, No, he played corner in college. I was right about that. I was reading. Yeah. I was reading the tweet that I posted and I'm looking at it like, wait a second. <laughs> um because he's saying in the safety class, he's making the transition to safety from corner. Um, but he understands that that's his that's his path in. And so I like the speed and athleticism he brings. He's not the biggest guy, but he plays physical for his size. Um, and so I like the I like Jalen Simpson kind of in that in that fifth round spot. Yeah, I like that. And you know, we need you need secondary guys right now, like I said. You need some yep. depth there. They still haven't they don't have a true replacement for Devin McCourty either, just getting more bodies in there is a good thing. Yeah, yeah. So uh, next guy, 167, is another position changer. This guy already made the position change, though. Tyrone Tracy uh, from Purdue, transferred to Purdue as a wide receiver, played wide receiver for a year, and then went back for his fifth year, and they were like, hey, uh, we need a running back. You want to be running back? And he's like, yeah, okay, sure. Runs for 700 yards and eight touchdowns as a running back. Um, obviously a good receiver out of the backfield, clearly used to be a wide receiver, but you know, also the contact balance, the athleticism, the vision, the key runs like a running back. He looks like a real running back. Um, and so I like this guy quite a bit again, later round pick, but i like the idea of him playing, you know, that running back wide receiver role, kind of like a Trey, uh, 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 Ty Montgomery type player. Yeah. Right. And so and that's kind of what's shown. What stuck with me. They've shown interest in these guys too. Like you said, Tom Montgomery, Antonio Gibson. Mm -hmm. This is a mm -hmm. prototype it seems like they have liked recently. I go back to Cordero Patterson. So, um, yeah, I would not be shocked at all. I think it would be interesting to have two of these guys on the roster at once, but I'm not, I, I don't hate it. I'm not mad yeah. at it. Yep. That would be great. All right. And then round six, I got two picks left here. Round six at 180. I drafted Hunter Norzad from Penn State. Now, Hunter Norzad, the guy just, he can't do anything, unfortunately. He he is very limited. He never played right guard at Penn State, which is upsetting. Never played right guard. He did, however, play left tackle, right tackle, left guard, and center at Penn State. Uh, he played literally everywhere except for right guard. Um, and so he's made the transition all over the field. Um, he's a center now. He played well at center last year. And I think that he's the guy for me that, you know, you want that Swiss Army knife, Swiss Army knife type guy to be your interior offensive lineman back up to a ton of different positions. He's not going to play tackle in the NFL. But for him, I think center or guard, that's an interesting situation for me. Um, so I like the idea 
of Hunter Norzad. Um, again, late round, you know, he's in the sixth round, but I like the idea of him there. Yeah, I like that. And especially day three, just grabbing interior offensive linemen. That's good value to, you know, just keep taking those guys until you get some starters or high quality backups out of it. And yep. they, we all know they need the depth there right now. Yeah, exactly. All right. And I, I lied. I have two more picks now. Uh, Jalen Green, who was in someone else's mock, James Madison. He's a little bit undersized. He missed the last four games of the season last year. Even after missing the last four games of the season, he finished the season leading FBS uh, in tackles for loss and sacks last year. So he was an absolute monster off of the edge. He's a little bit undersized. But man, he is... He can move off the edge. He's got some really good moves off the edge, and he can really move. Um, and so he's kind of an explosive guy that I like coming off the edge. Again, it's a late-round flyer. He went to James Madison. He's a little bit of an older guy because he's a fifth-year senior. But, like, whatever. Take a shot and see what you can get. Even if you only get one or two years of, of actual pass rush production or even, you know, 20 snaps a year or whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. If, if some of those snaps can be productive, it's enough when you're talking about, you know, pick 200 in the draft or whatever it is. Exactly. Yeah. This is, this is the time to take that risk. Exactly. And then the last pick is exactly the same thing. Anim Dakwa from Howard, six eight three fifty three. Big enough for you. Maybe uh, the guy's an absolute monster, just absolutely huge. Um, I believe he ran, he like ran pretty well at the combine as well. Um, and so he's not the most fluid guy. He's not super agile or anything like that, but he's just an absolute monster. And so it's like, well, why not take a shot on a guy that big and just see what happens? See if you can develop him in some sort of way. And again, you're drafting in the two thirties here. Like, well, who cares? You know? So that's my, uh, that's my pick there there's in the seventh a, round. There's there's just there's not a lot of guys who are six foot eight and who can play tackle. So <laughs> that's correct. Yes. It's uh I don't hate I don't hate the idea. Just throwing a pick there. I like your mock. I think there's yep. a lot of good stuff there and it raises the floor on this team significantly for next year if Mims gives you something. <laughs> yes, and that's the idea. You know, and, and again, right. And so, you know, and my my point, and this is what, you know, this is kind of the conversation. And the whole reason we're doing mock drafts is because you have the conversation of players, right? And someone in the chat mentioned that they hadn't heard of Michael Hall before. And they're like, oh, that's good. That's an interesting name, right? And so it's like, you know, you go through and you see some of these guys. Obviously, the day one, day two guys is one thing. But once you get into that day three, and especially then late day three, you know, it's like, who the heck knows who these guys are? And you're like, oh, my God, this dude? Like, holy crap. You know, look at the size of him or look at his movement skills or whatever the case may be. And so... Um, I think it's interesting to have, you know, to get a look at those guys. And again, that's why I'm, I'm, I feel very strongly about the fact that I won't take a guy twice in a mock because I just take, I just keep taking data Tana Bordellini and Ben Sinnott. I would do it. I would absolutely yeah. do it. You but I refuse to, you know, Ben Sinnott might be the new uh, Marcus Jones on this show. Oh goodness. If they he's draft not, he's not, not at that lose. level, but I know, but if they, I'm telling you, man, if they draft Tana Bordellini or Ben Sinnott, whew, I'll tell you, man, this yeah. would be. That'd be pretty unbelievable. So, but uh, <laughs> anyways, so that's it. That's my, uh, that's my seven round mock. So you can go, you can find that on one. Pat's pulpit. I, I always try to, you know, um, throw some Twitter stuff on there from them. And I also do a write up on, on each player and stuff. So, um, and we're working on with Brian and burned. We're working on some, uh, some player profiles. My Xavier Leggett one is up. As that's right, baby. I saw that. I was yeah. like, oh, okay. I like, I like that. Yeah. I, um, I compared his route running to Nikhil Harry at one point. Oh people in the comments were not happy with that. Well, I, Which can is, you blame them? <laughs> I, look, I like Xavier Leggett, but you watch I, watching him round off some of his routes at the, the top and the way his feet are looks a lot like what Nikhil Harry used to do. So uh, it's not ideal. That's certainly no. not ideal. Does not make me but, want Xavier Leggett. <laughs> but, but the other thing is just because one guy busts, sometimes the next guy figures it out. Uh, very true so good you point know. that's you a good know. point um yeah by the way before we go we have one other random patriots note i'll mention oh it's here you see the other announcement they made today it's very minor the uh oh the the captain's patches 
Yeah, they're adding captains patches to the jerseys this year, which it sounds like the players are very excited about this. Kendrick Bourne just put up on, I think it's Instagram or Twitter or something, that uh, a Photoshop of him wearing a captain's patch saying he's coming for it. Um, so, yeah, no, I mean, it's if the players like it, I'm all for it. I do think the captain's patches are very ugly. I've never liked them. <laughs> they are definitely ugly. Uh, they are definitely ugly. But, you know, what are you going to do? I, I'd rather uh, do like a sticker on the helmet or something. Like, I don't know. That I would like. Yeah, yeah. I feel like that's that works better because, especially like, you know, if it's you saw the Chiefs jerseys this year because they got a memorial patch all the time, and then you know you got Mahomes with this captain's patch, and then I think they have like an anniversary patch this year, and then they have the Super Bowl patch, and looking like the Boy Scouts out there. <laughs> yeah, it's too much. It's too much. I agree with yeah. you. Uh, yeah. By the way, KB, it's funny you just said that. I just I just opened up, literally just opened up Twitter, and Mike had like an hour ago tweeted out. Uh, Kendrick Bourne wants to be a team captain. He said, "Big goal yeah. mine working for it." So, and and by the way, he should be a team captain. Uh, he should be. Well, how many? How many do they have? How many can you have? Oh, unlimited. No, I don't know. I honestly don't uh, know. Six, maybe. Because because it's you know Hunter Henry's one, Dietrich Wise, David Andrews. Um, there's somebody else who was one who I'm forgetting. Bentley, uh, Bentley is one. Slater. No, well, Bentley. the guys who were, guys who are on the team, yeah, Bentley. Oh, guys who are on so, the team now. I see. Yeah, yeah. yeah Matt says four returning. That's yeah. yeah. Henry, Bentley, Wise, Andrews. Yeah. Yep. So I wonder. I'm, I'm curious who. Like, I think I could see Bourne getting one. Um, I think so. That, that that I think would make sense. So, yeah. Another thing. There was another announcement today. Somebody in the chat mentioned, which is that we are now the uh, official in the Brazilian market. That's right. Which, what I will say. I, what does one, that even I like, mean? Um, I, I think it has to do with the way the games get promoted. So I think they're going to promote us more heavily there. And uh, But we might end up with a game in Brazil. Like the Eagles are on Friday night opening in Brazil this year. I don't hate it. Interesting. But do you know what concerns me about it? Is that if they opt into it next year, if the Patriots lose a home game in back-to-back seasons oh. where they were supposed to have nines so that we yeah, have international games, that I wouldn't like. That's going to be frustrating. Yep. No. Yeah. Yep. I also, I also, I don't know if you saw the sheet for like what regions that every NFL team has, but my favorite team on there, is, it's the Steelers. I don't know if you saw this. Do you know no. what region they have? So they have, they're listed under Ireland. Oh God. They're also listed under the UK with an asterisk. And under that, it says only Northern Ireland. <laughs> So Northern Pittsburgh. Ireland. Jeez. So they have so they have Northern Ireland and Ireland, but not the rest of the UK. Is are, are the Steelers pushing for like the reunification of Ireland over here? Oh What's my going Lord. on? Lord, what are we talking about? That's insanity. Well, there you go. Steelers <laughs> trying to fix everyone's problems. I like it. <laughs> Mike insane. Mike Tomlin coming out in support of uh, Irish reunification was not something I had in my time <laughs> before bingo card. But maybe <laughs> happened. <laughs> Oh boy! Well, I also have I have other news as well. Um, oh. The Celtics were up sixty eight oh, yeah. to thirty eight, which is great. Um, the problem is they lost one twenty to one eighteen, and realistically, they really lost one twenty. I mean, they they scored a bucket with a second left, and so they to the Hawks, who stink. Um, the Celtics just, I mean, look, at this point, it doesn't matter. They've already clinched locked, everything, but it's just like, I feel those like are the frustrating nights right where you're like, what are we doing? Like, come on. How of course, many, people are flipping out about it, you know, but still. Yeah, it's frustrating. we're like, what, three, four weeks away from the regular season being done. April 14th is the last yeah. game. Yeah, these dudes yeah. have senioritis right now. Yeah. I don't really. Yeah. Just get us to the end. Yeah. Yeah, the Browns have yeah, Nigeria. That's, that's pointed out. Yeah. Anyways, it's just the, it's frustrating. Yeah, for the the Bruins and the Celtics, I feel like for both of these teams, I'm in just let's get to the playoffs mode now. Well, the Bruins like are the same way. The Bruins aren't a good team. I mean, people forget the Bruins aren't a good team. They weren't supposed to be good. They weren't supposed to make the playoffs this year. They're supposed to be bad just, this year. And they just got off to a crazy <laughs> hot start, like, which is now going to ensure that they're in the playoffs. Even right, and so it's like you know they still aren't that good, but like what the hell, you know what I mean? Like so well, it just well, that, you know that's right for the Bruins. I'm just like let's get to the playoffs and see what happens. I don't think right. they're going to win anything, but. We didn't think Florida was going to win anything last year, and they went to the cup. So well, listen, you know what? The Bruins, we the the Bruins were a wagon last year, and they lost in the first round. So, like, that's, you know, you lucky. never know. 
It never can happen. And that right. was a Panthers team that underperformed and got to the playoffs and turned it on. And, yep. You know, maybe the Bruins, you know, they, they overperformed to start the year, but they're probably underperforming a little bit right now. And yeah, you get to playoff atmospheres and energy and a little bit of a, a breather after the regular season for a minute and the right matchups. You never know what's going to happen. So yep. hopefully, Agreed. uh, and we'll probably, I forgot, we're probably going to have a Bruins playoff game during the draft like we did last year. I feel like that's almost guaranteed to happen. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So that's we'll okay. be, I'll be up here with my Bruins jersey while we're. Yeah, we get to, we'll, have, we'll have them both on. It'll be fine. Yeah. Or the Celtics okay. will be on. It'll be one of them. I can almost. Oh, you, yeah, I would think so. Yeah, I would think yeah. so. But, you know, it's okay. Yeah. yeah. So, all right. Well, that does it. That does it for us. Thanks, everyone, for uh, for coming out, listening. We appreciate it. The chat. As always, blowing up. We appreciate you guys. Um, and uh, we'll be back on Thursday night talking more more Patriots. More Patriots. More draft. More yeah. Drake May. More Jaden Daniels. More Caleb Williams. Nah, maybe they do something between now and then. You never know. Probably not. But you never know. Yeah. They are at the owners' meetings right now. So it is possible, at least. So you we'll can see. make a trade. That happens. Yep. Yep. So, anyways, all right. Thanks, guys. We appreciate it. And we'll uh, we'll talk to you Thursday night.